Hello everyone, I hope we're all doing well and uh, thank you all for joining us here today for our ACAP experience session. Um, I hope for those of you who are in non-Victorian states that you're enjoying your freedom. For those of us in Victoria, we are still locked down, but uh, looking forward to the end of it. Um, and of course, when it comes to these difficult times, it's quite interesting to start thinking about the nature of crime in itself. What's happening with crime rates? Um, where are we going to kind of, you know, go forward when it comes to various fines and sanctions that have been put in place by various states and governments? And so criminology is starting to become more and more relevant to our contemporary world. So just a couple of notes. Um, we don't have a course advisor attending today, unfortunately. Um, so I will give you an email address and a phone number to contact at the end of our session. Um, and I would ask that you please hold all of your questions until the end. Perfect. But yes, today I'm here to talk to you about what makes a victim. My name is Dr. John Whitehead, and I'm a lecturer here at ACAP. And if you join us, you will be seeing quite a bit of me. We're a small team, but we are an excellent team, and uh, we most certainly know our stuff about criminology. Perfect. So just to start off, a little bit about me. So I graduated with my PhD from Monash University in 2018. Before that, I was a bit of a child of the world born in England, grew up in South Africa, and am now firmly planted in Australia. I did my PhD on responding to sexual violence in Fiji, looking at customary ways of doing justice versus the very westernized criminal justice system. And this notion of westernization in itself is something that we're going to dig down deep into quite a bit today, thinking about different ways of conceptualizing victimization and different ways of actually kind of, you know, responding to victimization through ways of custom that might be more appropriate to located cultures on the ground. And apart from that, I have published a couple of articles. I've done some uh, confidential publication for government departments. Um, and yes, I'm thoroughly enjoying my time here at ACAP, where we get to know our students quite well. Um, we generally have quite small classes. And it means that we have a lot of face time. And um, yes, uh, students are always very comfortable approaching us when it comes to any issues. And should you be joining us, I'm sure that you will kind of, you know, as I said before, get to know me quite well alongside my colleagues, um, Dr. Peter Spratt, Dr. Rachel Joy, and uh, our discipline lead, Matthew Thurgood. Uh, so we do have somebody in the chat. Um, can we have a little bit of light on my face? Unfortunately, my setup at home is not ideal, um, just because we are working from home at the moment. And uh, yes, this is just a, a part of uh, the work from home experience, unfortunately. But uh, maybe it's better if I'm one of these people in the shadows, um, just randomly talking at you, maybe like an anonymous video or something like that. But I do apologize if there's not enough light. Um, so Nick Hart saying, hi, John, we certainly do have a course advisor. That would be myself. So Nick Hart is our course advisor. Um, I wasn't informed that he would be jumping in today. Uh, I was told that we wouldn't have one. Um, so should you have any questions about uh, ACAP, please direct them towards Nick, who I'm sure can walk you through kind of, you know, the process of applying and things such as that. Brilliant. So that's me. Uh, that's ACAP. Uh, we have a lovely little campus uh, in uh, the, the city here in Melbourne, but we're also quite diverse. We have in Sydney, I think we both from one recently in uh, Brisbane, and we, uh, yes, we have a wide variety of students from a wide variety of states. Um, and this is kind of, you know, one of the benefits of coming to ACAP is that you get to engage with such a diverse population in itself. So today we're going to be looking at the nature of victimization. It's something that's quite an interesting topic. It's something if you study criminology that we won't go into fully until about your third year, but it's something that many people are curious about. What makes this victim? What is the notion of victimization itself? How is victimization constructed? Because of course we need to remember that we come from an environment, a symbolic interactionist environment, in which our reality is very much constructed by our backgrounds. Our cultures is constructed by our interactions with people and interactions with our environment. So our notions that we read in the news, things like that, uh, these all feed back into ourselves and really construct who we are as a whole. So we do need to critically think about the way that society constructs victimization and how this differs between different cultures, different states, different countries, and things such as that. 
we'll also be looking at this notion of the discourse of victimization. So the terminology victim, what does this mean? Why is discourse so intrinsically important when it comes to either empowering individuals or potentially stigmatizing them to a large degree and recognizing the significant power that our words have really shaping society as a whole and shaping that victim's experience or that survivor's experience in itself. And then we'll move on to a little bit more of a theoretical area towards the end. We'll be looking at this notion of environmental crime and can there actually be a victim of environmental crimes? What about those victims who might not be human? What about those victims who are not born yet? Can we really consider them to be victims? And who can really class as the offenders when it comes to these notions of environmental crime in itself? So who are responsible and can we really class them as offenders? So we've got quite a packed schedule for today. I will try and get through it as quickly as possible. Um, I, at the same time, I'll try and speak as slowly as possible because I do know that sometimes I talk a little bit too fast. It's just the nature of my accent. But yes, let's move on to this ideal of victimology. And many of you might be thinking, what is victimology? Victimology does have quite a long history behind it. So we had authors such as Wolfgang and Mendelssohn essentially trying to construct typologies of victims. So trying to understand what makes somebody a victim and how that victim in themselves will act. Of course, these were created in the 1800s, the 1900s. So they were quite biased, they were quite racist, they were quite sexist. And so they've very much fallen away from the wider victimological tradition that we have within modern criminology as a whole. Instead, the real foundation of contemporary victimology was based upon the work of Mills Christie. And they essentially started to think about this notion of victim and how society constructs somebody as potentially a legitimate victim or a non-legitimate victim and started to question that notion of legitimacy. So how do we really frame somebody to be a legitimate victim? Of course, when we think about Christie's work, we further need to recognize that this was created in a European country. So it reflects that ideal of a European victim in itself. But it really boils down to this notion of innocence, this notion of non-criminality, this notion of vulnerability to a large extent. And Christie framed this through discussion of this little red riding hood, this ideal innocent characteristic that certain victims have. And because of the society intrinsically thinks of them as more worthy, thinks of them as more legitimate to a large extent. So I'll just move the microphone a little bit closer. And so we have this framing within our society, and I'm sure that you can think of various examples for this. When we have, you know, somebody who's attacked on the street, who is um, framed by that innocence, an older woman, a young child, society automatically responds in uproar. Society perceives that victimization to be intrinsically legitimate. However, if we have a young man, a strong man, attacked on the streets, we don't have that same outcry. We don't acknowledge that same legitimacy in itself. And we can actually start to take this slightly further if we look at the space in which people are attacked. So think about a space again in public. Public spaces are supposed to be safe. We expect them to be safe. And because of this, when somebody is attacked in public, we do see that vitriolic reaction by society. We see them essentially saying that this should not have happened. There should have been a greater police presence. Why did this happen? However, this doesn't really fit within the narrative of the home space, the much more private space. And when it comes to many forms of victimization, we know that these don't occur in public. They occur within that private space. And so the victims of these forms of offenses are not really considered within this legitimate framing. And that can be quite problematic because it means that they don't get sympathy. Potentially, the police aren't responding in an adequate manner. They don't believe the victim to a large extent. Potentially, the support services aren't available and the victim's narrative is question to a large degree. So this ideal victimization is really skew skewing the way in which we respond to people's, well, to, to, to people's victimization in itself. And again, obviously quite problematic. So this is obviously kind of, you know, the, the notion that was put forward within the 1980s, victimization has really kind of, you know, changed in its discourse since then. So we have seen kind of, you know, work framing rather than ideal, um, this notion of legitimacy. So what makes a legitimate victim? Alongside that, we've started to push the boundaries of vic uh, victimology, thinking about victims in different contexts. So who is a legitimate victim of various forms of offending? 
However, we still see it boils down to this narrative of somebody who's seen as particularly vulnerable within our society, rather than those people who might in themselves be victims, but don't have that legitimacy actually behind them. So when we think about this conceptualization of the ideal victim that was originally put forward by Christie, we can see that it really does frame this narrative of innocence. It frames this narrative of weakness as a whole. So here we have this notion of the child, the weakness. Um, it's quite sexist in itself and it reflects the sexism in our society. When it frames kind of, you know, the victimization of women to be kind of, you know, within that weaker framing as a whole too. We have older individuals. Obviously, society is particularly upset when older individuals are victimized, recognizing their frailty, recognizing the, their weaknesses to some extent. And obviously, this is quite problematic because it does in itself start to further narratives of sexism, of ageism. Moreover, when we think about the notion of children actually being weak in themselves, we further need to recognize that this ideal has really, well, it's a really relatively recent construct. It was only brought about in Victorian England. Before then, children were just considered to be little humans, uh, little adults, and would essentially go out and do jobs. And yes, we had kind of, you know, workhouses, things such as that. I'm sure for any of you who have read a Dickens novel, you'll kind of, you know, get that narrative of what children were actually kind of framed as during that time. But this notion that our perceptions of victims can change is so incredibly important too, because it means that if the idea of children being victims has changed, obviously other narratives and further narratives within the contemporary world can most certainly be changed. And potentially we can take away this very sexist, ageist narrative out of ideals of victimization in itself. Furthermore, we have this notion of the respectable activity. So essentially the victim can't have been doing something illegal. And um, we, of course, we need to recognize that many people who are victims are doing things who are illegal. People can be victimized in many ways. People can be assaulted in prison. People can be assaulted by the police. However, they don't follow that victim narrative because in some way they're not really seen to be a upstanding member of society as a whole. And obviously this is quite problematic. We don't see sympathy for the Carl Williams individuals in our society. They're seen to have gotten what was coming to them, not recognizing that that victimization actually occurred. And it's problematic that that victimization has actually occurred. But society unfortunately just does not care. Moreover, this notion of the safe space, and I've discussed this slightly before when it comes to this public space in itself. So we expect the public spaces to be safe, but ironically, we don't expect those home spaces to be safe, which kind of, you know, inverts our notion of what safety is in itself. It even inverts our ideals of criminal legislation. So when we have an act aggravated burglary, so essentially a burglary when the homeowner is in the house, that can have a sentence of up to 25 years. That is considered to be a significantly serious crime because you have invaded that person's home. However, when it comes to this notion of the home and recognizing victimization, particularly when it comes to crimes against women, we don't really recognize that. And so our conceptualizations of safe spaces are in themselves wrong. And we only have to think about the tragic murders that have occurred within Melbourne over the past few years, particularly those within public spaces, uh, individuals such as Eurydice Dixon, where there were campaigns to take back the night, campaigns to try and make that space safe again. However, there was a complete ignoring of the wider dis discussion and narrative that the majority of femicides, the majority of, of, of gendered violence really occurs within this home space too. So obviously that's quite problematic. Obviously that's a narrative that we do need to shift. And potentially if you come to ACAP, you get your degree and you go on to do your own research, this could be a narrative that you could shift to. We further have this ideal of kind of, you know, strangeness, and we only have to look at potentially our own background in primary school and things such as that to recognize this ideal of the stranger being the evil one, the stranger being the one that we actually need to avoid. Think about the stranger danger campaigns. Think about you shouldn't talk to strangers and things such as that. This is not what evidence tells us about the majority of uh, child abuse situations, child abductions, all of this. Instead, these are committed by people who are known to the victim. These are acquaintances, these are family members. This does not gel with our ideal knowledge of how the, these type of offenses actually occur. And yes, that is intrinsically problematic, but society doesn't frame it in that way. Think about Madeleine McCann. It's the, that stranger, that 
unknown individual who has stolen innocence to a certain extent that creates our ideal and legitimate victim. And moreover, we want the offender to be big and bad. If we've got somebody who's kind of quite scrawny, if we've got somebody who's seen as weak, we don't really paint them as the offender. In some way, we think of them as victims themselves, that something might have gone, something might have provoked the offense, that the victim in some way precipitated or facilitated the crime against them. We want to think of the offender as that big bad wolf. We want that binary there, that good and that bad, that light and that dark. So we want them to be, you know, a well-muscled individual who's quite tall and who looks scary and who is incredibly intimidating. And again, this is not always the case. When it comes to financial crime, there's a wide variety of individuals who can engage in that. Even when it comes to gang crimes, we have girl gangs who are out there operating, who don't fit this big and bad narrative in itself which of course is quite problematic because really what all of this does is to start to shape society's narratives of who should be the victim and who should be the offender and in doing so it starts to exclude certain offenders exclude certain victims and as i said before sometimes does start to create that much more victim blaming narrative in itself so I would ask you to go away at the end of this uh, lecture, and I'll ask you to think about some of the, the framing of victims and offenders within the newspaper. Think about the way in which they're painted by society and think about potentially that discourse that we use when discussing them. Even this notion of offender, we can see applies a label to somebody potentially not recognizing their own victimization. And so it can become so incredibly problematic and can mean that we are not addressing various problems in our society. But as I've said before, this conceptualization that was actually put forward by Christie was in the 1980s. Has our society really changed? And we can say to a large extent, it really hasn't. We still have patriarchy and sexism throughout the world, regardless of culture, regardless of country. Women are still framed as exceptionally weak. And those women who are not framed as weak are framed as monsters. This is what we call kind of, you know, this Madonna whore dichotomy, that uh, women offenders are either seen as intrinsically um, innocent or are seen as absolute evil in themselves. So we can most certainly see that kind of you know, occurring in the world today. We can see that when it comes to certain types of offenses where the offender is more likely to be big and bad, um, those offenses where the, the offender does represent our ideal offender, these get much more news time than those offenses that, that don't have that big and bad offense, offender. So we don't see a wider discussion of things such as corruption, recognizing the, the wide variety of uh, victims that this can create, the significant amount of victimization. We don't see that wider discussion in itself. Moreover, when it comes to various cultures, again, we really need to think about this ideal of victimization and does this really change? So within my work within Fiji, we had a different framing of the ideal victim that was specifically through this narrative of virginity, this narrative of purity, because it's so important to Fijian cultures. So we have the Otaki culture, the indigenous Fijians and the Indo-Fijians. It was so intrinsically important to you know, that cultural ideal of what makes a victim, that it's something that everybody discussed. And when there was a case of loss of virginity, um, the pub, there was public outcry. If this was not the case, then sometimes the police would not even investigate. And I think reflect upon your own cultural background to a certain extent and think about kind of, you know, how victims are framed within your country. What actually makes a victim in itself? What type of offenses construct victimization more than others? So when it comes to this notion of kind of, you know, the ideal offense in itself too, which is something I'm working on, we have this well, society has these offenses in themselves that are seen to be much more legitimate. These are the ones that we class as serious to a large degree. However, we don't acknowledge the impact of victimization upon the individual in itself. So when it comes to somebody stealing $10, many of us might think that that's not really that much of a big deal. So the, the criminal justice system should not be operating that hard on the individual. Essentially, we should just give them a slap on the wrist and let them go. But what happens when it breaks that person, well, the victim's faith in society, when they can't pay their rent, when potentially they can't buy themselves food? What about those significant impacts of victimization that society aren't really recognizing as a whole?
However, of course, we are making headway when it comes to recognizing various victims, increasing our knowledge of victims. And we only have to look at kind of, you know, recognizing various forms of genocide. We only have to acknowledge the way that the media starts to treat larger nation states in themselves when it comes to various victimization on the ground and the discourse surrounding that we we are creating that recognition there are significant pushes within the victorian criminal uh, justice system for things such as a victim's right to review so the victim can actually understand potentially why their case was dropped by the prosecutor there's also obviously the wider narrative of the let them speak campaign which allows sexual violence survivors to really talk and dis about and discuss what has happened to them and have previously well when they have previously been silenced by the courts so there's a greater focus on notions of victimization and this greater focus is so intrinsically important in itself Moreover, we can really think about the notion of victimization swift, uh, shifting depending on cultural context. So think about Ned Kelly, that ideal kind of you know hero within the Victorian context. He was an outlaw and all of that. But what society has done has really framed him as the victim to a certain extent. And yes, he was victimized, but at the same time, he caused a significant amount of victimization. Society has framed him as a hero, but potentially we do need to be framing him as the villain. We can see this kind of notion of the anti-hero constantly pushed throughout our media. So you only have to watch The Boys on Amazon. And if you haven't watched it, I thoroughly recommend that you do. It's an exceptional show. We only have to think of, you know, the old Westerns. Um, it really is kind of, you know, a consistent theme within our society too. So try and think critically about the discourse that's used when it comes to victimization, the people who are framed as the victims and what society tries to, to push upon us when it comes to narratives of victimization in itself. But as we are talking about this discourse of victimization, so why do we use terms such as victim, terms such as survivor? Obviously, there's a significant amount of debate surrounding that. Moreover, beyond survivor, we've started to discuss this ideal of the survivor advocate, somebody who actually speaks up about their various forms of victimization. And this is because victim has a very passive meaning behind it, as we can see from the quote that we have up there on the slide. It really frames it as socially acceptable to a certain extent. When we think about victims within classic literature, these are all sacrificial victims. They have that notion of kind of you know, purity lost to a certain extent. And because of this, it does become quite problematic. When we think about this ideal victim in themselves, we can potentially see that some type of purity has been lost. Their status within society has been lost to some extent. And that is really problematic. It impacts the wider notions of victimization within our entire society. Rather than lifting up victims, instead we push them down, we feel sorry for them. We give them support, but maybe it's not the support they need. We constantly kind of, you know, uh, well, we, we wear, well, we put them in cotton wool when potentially they don't need to be put in cotton wool. So our notions or our discourse just surrounding the ideals of victimization are so intrinsically important, which is why we push towards this term for survivor. But again, survivor can be incredibly problematic too, because when we talk about survivor, we're only really talking about gender defenses in itself. We're only framing gender defenses through that survivor narrative. If somebody's robbed on the street, we don't call them a survivor. So why are we framing some crimes and some victims within that survivor narrative in itself? Why are we kind of like conceptualizing somebody as a survivor versus a victim? And of course, this comes to, down to our notions of the severity of the crime within society. We see certain crimes as severe, and because of that, we as a society are exceptionally um, upset about them. We have that vitriolic reaction, not recognizing that individual level of trauma that potentially does mean that somebody needs to be labeled as a survivor in themselves. So this ideal of discourse is so intrinsically important. And as I've discussed before, it also reflects upon this ideal kind of, you know, offender, who we call an offender. We don't recognize that offenders in themselves can be victims for certain types of offenses. We must certainly know that the offenders most likely have had some history of um, victimization themselves, particularly when it comes to things such as um, child sexual abuse. We've recognized that quite often these abusers have been victims and this is how their love maps were kind of, you know, created by these abusers themselves.
So that is so incredibly problematic. Does that then frame them as a survivor, an offender, or somewhere in between? And then we further need to kind of, you know, expand upon this, recognizing that terms such as victims, terms such as survivors are really framed by a much wider Western narrative in itself. So we are imparting this discourse upon many countries that don't follow our Western framing of, you know, language, that don't follow our Western framing of belief structures, that don't follow our Western culture as a whole. And so by kind of using this discourse and forcing this discourse into other countries through various advocacy groups, through the creation of very westernized legislation, we're actually disempowering those victims to a large extent. We are stripping them away of that located narrative. And we're also pushing them towards the Western criminal justice system. This notion of victimization and being a survivor are westernized. We are saying then you should utilize the Western criminal justice system, regardless of what is appropriate for you, what your cultural background states that would be the greatest way to heal this type of offense. Instead, we are pushing you towards going through the courts, going to the police and all of that. And so it can just be incredibly victimizing for that person on the ground who does not have that narrative, that, that internal narrative that they want to express and who is essentially being colonized in their mind by our Western way of discussing victims as a whole. So now onto something that is quite exciting, victims of environmental crime. And as I said before, this is a very growing area of criminology. It, it focuses through a theoretical lens of green criminology and green criminology is a relatively recent school of thought. Historically, when it comes to international crimes, when it comes to crimes against the environment, criminology has not significantly focused upon these. Instead, we have tried to understand things through grassroots level. We have looked at individual offenders through positivism. We have looked at small groups and small cultures through kind of, you know, the sociology of crime and deviance. We've started to get into ideals of um, intersectional crime and deviance. So we started to look at the many layers of oppression that actually create deviance in itself that create victimization in itself but we've only really started to, to fully expand into these international crimes and notions of victimization uh, relatively recently and moreover this is most certainly a an area where australia is at the forefront when it comes to the big green criminologists they are centered in australia it's something that of course we need to recognize we need to recognize that unfortunately um, our environmental policy isn't the best and much of the world's environmental policy isn't the best and so we have that significant drive here to push towards recognizing the victims of environmental crimes because we do need to recognize climate change is happening climate change is occurring and while we have certain court cases that have been brought before um, well, that have been brought uh, essentially from individuals on the ground at the moment they are not suffering from the full extent of victimization of environmental crime uh, they are at the moment living through a, a small aspect of that and so we need to start thinking about those later victims and if they can actually ever be victims. So I saw in the chat, somebody quickly brought up this ideal of animals. So can animals actually be the victims of the crime? How are we kind of, you know, framing animals? Are we only framing those animals that have kind of, you know, a higher consciousness in themselves so they can recognize the victimization? Or should we start to think about the wider environment and all animals actually being able to be victims? And of course, this is going to cause a significant amount of debate because if we start thinking about all animals actually being victims, this is then going to impact our life, our, our livelihoods you know when we recognize that potentially eating meat is completely wrong and that even kind of you know chasing away magpies and things such as that can be incredibly problematic in itself um so we do need to think about that moreover we can see the significant um, economic impacts that victim, this type of victimization of environmental crime is actually uh, having we can see that it's well with the, dirt, the deep water horizon spill we can see that there was that significant financial impact on many people there we can see that when it comes to you know various countries across the world that that take on uh, uh, australian rubbish and american rubbish and all of this yes they, they take this on and they do get that economic 
benefit potentially, but at the same time, there's a significant environmental loss there. So this notion of economics is so intrinsically important and we need to start thinking um, within an Australian framing too. So if we think about the recent bushfires, we can recognize the wider economic impact there. When we think about the drought that has occurred, we can think about the economic impact and the significant impacts that these notions of victimization in itself are going to have well down the line. This is not just something that's going to end. Instead, we are going to have this form of victimization occurring for a significant amount of time. And because it's going to be occurring for such a significant amount of time, what do we do about people who haven't been born yet? What do we do about those who are potentially still growing up? Can we really class them as victims if they haven't experienced the significant victimization that other individuals and other animals have? Can we really class them as victims when, it can, when they are going to grow up in these circumstances? So they might not even recognize their own victimization. They might not recognize that they can't see a certain animal because they were never exposed to that animal. They don't care about that animal. They might not recognize that, you know, we should have perfectly clear beaches. Instead, beaches to them should be full of rubbish and things such as that. So is that in itself then actual victimization and how should we really be classing this victimization? Alongside this, when we start to recognize victimization, we can start to delve into who are the offenders. And of course, there are many offenders. And this notion of offendership and this label of offender becomes so incredibly complex when we think about environmental crimes. When we contextualize that not only can it be, you know, this large multinational corporation that's cutting down rainforests in Borneo and the Amazon, um, leading to significant loss of life for animals, but it can be your everyday person at home who is not recycling. It can be somebody who's dropping a cigarette butt on the side of the street. The notions of offendership are so incredibly vast and potentially this is why we haven't really done anything when it comes to responding to environmental crimes because it's just so intrinsically difficult. Moreover, when we think about environmental crime in itself, we further need to recognize that this does not occur in a vacuum. We don't only have one offender who be that person on the ground, be it that large multinational corporation. Multinational corporations are allowed to do things because state governments allow them to do things. Essentially, they can weaken environmental legislation that allows those activities to take place. And so is then the state responsible? But can the state be responsible given that the state is the one that makes the laws? And even if we want the state to be responsible, how do we ultimately hold them responsible? We've seen many times in international criminal justice. In fact, we see it at the moment with what's going on in America with various detainment camps for um, migrants that without kind of, you know, a political will, without, you know, trying to challenge them, nothing will actually be done. And we can't challenge very large and very powerful countries because they are the economic and military powerhouses of the world. So what really do we do then? How do we engage with the states to make them follow the correct rules in itself? Alongside this, of course, we as consumers are directly responsible. If we're buying goods from various large multinational corporations, we are tacitly supporting their actions. And many forms of kind of, you know, you'd be incredibly surprised by how many products are made by very few multinational corporations in itself. So even if we try and live a very ethical life, this is incredibly difficult in itself because it's, well, you're going to be buying from these companies anyway. So what do we really do about that? And how can we actually respond to environmental crime and these victims that it creates? Those victims well down the track, kind of long after we've all passed away, how do we actually acknowledge their victimization in itself? So it is going to be intrinsically challenging. But these are some of the debates that modern criminology is engaging with. This is why we've started to look at international crime. We've started to look at the impact of large multi multinational corporations in various states. We've even started to look at individuals who are kind of, you know, cooperating with states to pollute certain environments. However, one thing that really has become clear to us is when it comes to environmental crimes, unfortunately, these are very much located in what we can consider to be the global south. So these are the previously colonized countries. These are what you can think about as developing countries. And the reason that these are kind of you know, conglomerated there, they are located there to a large extent, is because of the larger powers within the global economic sphere. It is because of disadvantage within those communities and disadvantage within those countries.
So how can we really respond to this? We can't just automatically lift everybody out of poverty. And unfortunately, when it comes to various loans that have been provided by multinational corporations, international governments, it does hold various countries in a bit of a legislative bind as a whole. They want to try and help their population, but it means that many incredible environments in themselves are being polluted. There are many um, chemical spills. There are many forms of victimization and health risks and things such as that which are actually occurring. So it does become incredibly problematic and if you join it at, us at ACAP you can have a bit of a think about it, you can have a bit of a discussion on how we actually try and solve various forms of environmental crimes. So when it comes to victimization, what actually is a victim in itself? How do we really frame that? And I think the best way to do this is to start expanding our conceptualizations. Again, when we think about this notion of victim, we have very kind of hard criteria. Uh, quite often this is based upon the offense. So this person has uh, been robbed and that only makes their victimization up to this level. This person um, has been murdered. So their family's victimization is off the charts. We're not recognizing the wider diverse impacts of victimization, the wider diverse conceptualizations of victimization and the wider discourses of victimization that exist within our world. Instead, we're automatically trying to push a very Western narrative that can be intrinsically damaging to those victims of crime that are not believed or are not framed as legitimate to a large degree. And this is something that we all do on a daily basis. When you talk about crimes, you probably put them into the categories of severe. But should we be utilizing words such as that? Should we be any at any time calling a type of offense severe when it can have severe impacts on the victim in themselves? But this creates problems. So we do have many responses to victimization. We have many support groups to, to victimization. However, these are generally based upon best practice that says that victimization should only be up to a certain level if this occurred to you. There's sometimes not this wider recognition of the diverse impact of this within society, within the criminal justice system, and within these support organizations in itself. So how do we really start to respond to this. And again, we can start to reflect upon this notion, notion of environmental crime and how do we actually respond to environmental crime. It's so exceptionally diverse. It's pollution. It's cutting down the rainforests. It's it's the destruction of our natural environments, such as the Great Barrier Reef. It's the spreading of pesticides in third world countries um, that lead to significant health problems. How do we really kind of respond to all of this? And is it even possible to respond to all of these forms of victimization? Sometimes, unfortunately, voices are going to get lost. But ideally, we should be trying to listen to as many as possible. So that's my quick presentation for you today. I hope that you all enjoyed it. It sounds like, the, well, it seems like the chat was going a little bit wild today. So before I leave you, I'm just going to take you through a little bit about ACAP. So when it comes to criminology, we do have these two degrees, the Bachelor, Bachelor of Criminology and Justice, which is our main degree. So this will give you a bachelor's degree at the app, not the app the finish of your course and the associate's degree which is a much lower level degree um, but in itself can be quite worthwhile and even if you're not keen on signing right up for a bachelor's you can always sign up for an associate's and from there kind of figure out where you want to go most certainly it can kind of particularly if you want to go into a very well the criminal justice system if you want to go into areas of victim support criminology can be an invaluable tool uh, regarding that and throughout our different kind of, you know, courses, we explore a significant range of topics. And it was so difficult to narrow down what to talk to you about today. So we go into theoretical criminology. We understand the early positivistic foundations of this. So we look at the way that everybody was assumed to be born a criminal to a certain extent. Then we look at the way that uh, society shapes deviancy. We start to look at the environment and recognize the criminogenic risk factors within that, the lack of cultural institutions, why we see certain types of crimes, offencing, uh, uh, crimes and offenses in smaller towns and uh, not within bigger cities. Why does this actually occur in itself and start to engage with some of the Marxist and feminist debates surrounding that. We then go even further. We start to talk about some of the significant issues within our criminal justice system. We start to look at the 
function of the correction system, the courts, we look at the function of the police in itself and start to critically analyze uh, what their limitations are, how these operate in some ways to potentially stigmatize the population and in some ways also lead to crime in itself. So very much trying to address that on this policing and criminal justice system level to a large degree. We have our applied criminology course, which takes you right through how to do criminological research, how to frame a theoretical framework in your study, what studies potentially need to be done, looking at the various methodologies. So those of you who want to go into research positions, it can be incredibly beneficial and essentially teach you how to write a, a thesis should you go on to do higher study after your degree here with ACARE. We have a full course on victimology, which engages with every form of victim that you could possibly imagine. We discuss this narrative of the ideal victim. We discuss the gendered victimization in itself. We discuss, uh, so within that, the LGBTIQ plus community. We discuss narratives of victimization within other countries. So what constructs a victim specifically in this country or that country? We've got our, for every course that you could possibly imagine, um, international criminal justice, which I'm teaching at the moment, which looks at the function of the international criminal court, how we respond to things such as genocide and how problematic these responses can sometimes be, recognizing that it reflects power, it reflects victors of justice. We have a cultural diversity unit, which talks about the significant and historic marginalization and violence against the indigenous population of Australia and how this has led to their overrepresentation in the criminal justice system. Not only um, the indigenous population but also other migrant groups such as the South Sudanese community that was pegged for the African gang crisis. Um, we have a course on federal law, we have a course on forensic psychology for those of you who are interested in kind of you know the criminal mind. We have a significant amount of well courses that that have some brilliant scholars teaching them a significant amount of experience teaching in itself. So we try and provide the most holistic picture possible when it comes to criminology, not only the causes of crime, the responses, and most importantly, some of the very critical challenges that we have in our society as a whole. And for those of you who like your psychological sciences, you can, of course, take our Bachelor of Psychological Science and Criminology. So this will give you a very, very good grounding, not only in the much more social science of criminology, but the much more positivistic science of psychology. And I know our psychology team are just as exceptional. In fact, I hope that some of you might have attended their um, experience sessions that they put forward to. So, well, I suppose come to ACAP. Uh, we're always very happy to have new students and we have such a, a wealth of experience to kind of, you know, bring to you. And when you want to study at ACAP, so what do you do? How do you go about studying at ACAP? So you can complete our online application form and after that a course advisor will contact you and essentially talk you through what the options are. One area where we're different from other institutions is that we actually sit down and talk to you. We want to know about your future plans. We want to know about what you're doing at the moment. We want to know how our course will actually best suit you because we don't want you coming to ACAP wasting your time, wasting your money and going out of it not having a good experience in itself. Instead, what we want to do is make sure that your ambitions align to the courses that we can actually offer you. And so you can talk that through with a course advisor. They can give you all of the information. And through that, you can feel confident making that choice and making that decision to actually jump into ACAP at the same time. And then we will review your application or our elves in student administration will review your application. And from there, a decision will be made and uh, yes, well, hopefully we'll see you on campus um, in the coming trimesters, particularly on camp campus, given that things seem to be opening up a small degree. So what's next? You can view all the sessions that you might have missed on our ACAP YouTube channel. You can also re review some historic um, YouTube videos that we've kind of, you know, put up there for you. Uh, so it can give you a good idea of some of the topics that have been covered before. Uh, we do have a very good presentation on crime in the media that was given by Matthew Thurgood uh, a few months ago uh, that really contextualizes this notion of the media and how this impacts our perception of crime in itself. Matthew Thurgood, um, an expert on terrorism, so really kind of, you know, engaging with that ideal of how we have fear within our society based upon crime. And if you have any questions, please reach out to our course advisor. So we've got the email there that you can quickly shoot one to, and we've got 
their uh, phone number. So please feel free to reach out to them. If you'd like to can even reach out to me, my email is on the ACAP webpage. Shoot me an email, tell me what you're interested in. I can kind of, you know, help recommend potentially one of our courses that you might enjoy in itself. If you're interested in criminology and you want to you know, go on to do further research, research or something like that, I'm more than happy to point you in whatever direction that I can. So for those of you with additional questions, you can chat to our course advisor in the uh, chat window here. But just for the moment, does anybody have any questions regarding the presentation that I've given today and our little experience session? So do you have any questions about notions of victimization in itself? Do you have any thoughts? Anything like that? I do know that I think that some questions did pop up as I was talking, so I'll just go back. Um, so Fern asking, is the climate crisis considered to be an environmental crime? And most certainly we could consider it to be an environmental crime. It does have diverse range, well, I mean, very wide ranging impacts in itself. Of course, recognizing things such as the drought that has caused a significant amount of victimization. The thing is, how are we framing this potentially as a crime if we don't have criminal legislation that is actually covering this? And this starts to engage wider with how we really conceptualize crime in itself. So is crime specifically something that has been legislated? or is crime instead something that we consider to be morally wrong that society has essentially said this is right out and we don't want anybody doing that most certainly there's a wider consensus that you know not engaging with various um, uh, environmental technology not signing kind of you know the paris accords and the tokyo agreements and all of that really is in itself quite reprehensible for nation states so potentially we can consider it to be a crime and of course there's a significant amount of discourse talking about you know some of the vitriolic reactions we have in our society when it comes to this lack of action on climate change in itself and then if we go down to the bottom um so can you give an example of the cultural differences you briefly mentioned? I think you know the court system, the Western way of dealing with crime, which I thought was interesting. How might other cultures prefer to deal with crime? So this is actually one of my areas of expertise because I do look into customary ways of doing justice. And so we need to, of course, recognize before colonization happened, there were many, many cultures that had different ways of dealing with offending within their group. Typically, what we have within a Western culture is a very individualized view of notions of rights. So we think of rights as something that is intrinsically imbued upon us. I, my background has suddenly just disappeared, so you can now apparently see my terrible room. I do apologize for that, uh, but we'll just leave it up. Uh, so we have this, this notion that rights are intrinsically imbued within in us, and that is it. Within other cultures, particularly communitarian cultures in the global south, we see that these notion of rights are much more duties towards the collective. And so when it comes to doing criminal justice, we see the collective actually getting involved. And this can be through uh, things such as yarning circles. Um, my particular focus was on the Ataki way of doing kind of justice. So this was Bulu Bulu, which is essentially what you could think of almost as a mediation ceremony. This does not necessarily mean that it didn't have a punitive outcome, but instead it really focused upon healing the wider village. And this is one of the considerable problems with the criminal justice system is that it is there to assign blame it is there to deter offenders and wider society from actually committing that crime again it doesn't have that intrinsic notion of healing behind it instead within society we are particularly punitive and we push for very um, harsh punishments towards the offender what customary justice quite often does is recognize that this offense has occurred but this person is still a part of the village in themselves so instead of sending them to prison where we lose all the pro-social contacts potentially they are welcomed back into the village they are well the act is shamed which reinforces these social norms and social morals but there's not this kind of shaming of the individual and pushing them away that can lead to further offending in itself and there are many different examples of this so uh, if we look at north america at the moment so there's navajo peacemaking which utilizes um, indigenous navajo stories to essentially contextualize the offending as wrong i mean we only have to think about kind of you know our own utilization of things such as sentencing circles and the Cory Court, which is much more of a hybridization of customary justice in the Western criminal justice system. We have it in Fiji. Wherever there's really an indigenous culture, we'll see a different way of doing justice. And quite often this is very different. 
from the criminal justice system itself. And this has led to wider discussions about changing the criminal justice system and utilizing a paradigm that we call restorative justice, which is very much about a meeting between the victim and the offender. The victim can say, this is how this offense impacted me. And the offender can then contextualize how this offense actually occurred, why did it occur in itself? And in doing so, we can actually promote healing that the criminal justice system does not. So we can actually try and mend relationships rather than potentially just stigmatizing the offender and not giving the victim a place to um, tell their story. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, if you're interested, you can always shoot me an email. I'm always happy to discuss it. Uh, as I said, it's one of my specialties, so I quite enjoy it. Um, but apart from that, go and look up other cultures and the way that they've actually done justice. So uh, Lila asking, what do you think of the idea of abolishing and funding the police? So you've touched upon a very prevalent issue at the moment. We've seen some significant concerns within policing across the world. Historically, we've also had these significant concerns of policing in Australia. We certainly see that some groups are over-policed. We only have to look at the way in Melbourne, for those of you in Melbourne, we have kind of no police officers potentially in the stations, the inner city stations, but then you go out to communities such as um, Sunshine, communities such as uh, Braybrook, and this is a significant police presence on the, the train stations there, or top of the train station. And this is the over-policing of certain minority groups due to the Sudanese gang crisis, um, which is obviously quite problematic because if you over-police a certain group, of course you're gonna catch more offenders. Every Everybody does deviant activity, it's just a part of life. But when you've got a greater police presence there, you are going to catch more offenders and it's going to throw out our crime statistics in itself. This is not to say that the police are not intrinsically bad. There are concerning elements within the police force. So we have started to see uh, a rising right, right wing ideology within certain members, obviously significantly concerning and something that does need to be addressed. There does need to be cultural change within the police force. However, within an Australian context, we are very lucky that the police are quite civilianized compared to America where they are quite militarized. And the police within Australia do seem to have a significant focus on de-escalation de of certain situations rather than America, where it's all about escalation. So I think it really depends on the context that you're looking at. But certainly things need to change. Within Australia, please, things need to change. Um, within Vic Pole, things need to change. But that's a longer process in itself and uh, potentially not abolishing or defunding them, but larger whole scale cultural change is needed. Um, so Tony's saying people have personal concept standards of victimization. So does the st state, society, the system? Um, is the difference explained, is the difference ex experienced as corruption? Um, so I'm not entirely sure what you mean there by is the difference experienced as corruption. Um, but yes, we all do really have kind of, you know, our own notions of victimization. And when we think about this ideal of corruption in itself, we don't really kind of, you know, recognize this wider notion of victimization that actually occurs. Think about, um, the Banking Royal Commission, where there wasn't really that wider acknowledgement of that, yes, the banks have been doing something wrong. And we draw, drew upon these, these victim narratives, so those who were seen as particularly weak, particularly vulnerable, old people who potentially lost their super, lost their houses, things such as that. We didn't draw upon the, the many members of society who were in some way taken advantage of by those banks. And even when it comes to kind of, you know, corruption scandals that we, or ongoing corruption scandals, we do need to start to question what the impacts of that victimization were. So where potential money could have been uh, misappropriated and where potentially that could have gone to actually address uh, social needs in itself. Because when we strip away social needs, we are again creating, creating victimization to a certain ex extent. So we need to think about it as well, <laughs> very uh, uniquely when it comes to various forms of offending in itself and start to recognize our ideals of victimization um, are rather warped by society as a whole where we don't see corruption potentially as a problem, where we don't acknowledge the victims. Um, so Brisbane have totally different police actions. However, I do have concerns about the corruption, et cetera. What role will you suggest to help this current situation, future work? Um, so here we're engaging, so when I was talking about restorative justice earlier, that was an ideal put forward by John Braithwaite, who is one of the great Australian criminologists. And he's gone on to work on this notion of responsive regulation. So what is quite problematic within these, these corrupt organizations is there's not a perception that what they're doing is actually wrong. Instead, there's a perception that this is just what needs to be done for business to be 
achieved. And this can happen within large financial companies or within the police force, within government agencies. What needs to happen is the introduction of pro-social attitudes and pro-social beliefs and pro-social cultures. And the way to do this is starting to integrate individuals who have these various beliefs at all stages of the, the managerial ladder. And hopefully, given enough time, these pro-social attitudes can actually be spread throughout the entire company. Unfortunately, John Braithwaite further says that we shouldn't actually be using external fines and ex external punitive measures to address kind of you know, various companies' uh, mismanagement and, and various criminal actions, which is obviously quite controversial in itself and something that potentially I don't agree with. But uh, this notion of cultural change by uh, injecting pro-social pro attitudes within the company and the police force is most certainly what is needed, at least from my perspective. Um, so many people's justice is another person's creating of victims. The problem is yet to, uh, is yet to be a better world, not a prescribed one, um, but an agreed one, a Venn diagram expressed understanding of victims, uh, of justice and minimal victims. I, I think you really touch upon a really good point there that no matter how we kind of, you know, do justice, potentially we can be creating victimization. So even when kind of we think about the criminal justice system in itself. So maybe victims might uh, feel cathartic going through that process that their case is actually finally being heard. Unfortunately, many victims don't feel that way. Instead, they can feel quite marginalized by the criminal justice system as a whole. And because they feel so marginalized, they can actually um, withdraw their case or refuse to testify so that the director of public prosecution would not have any evidence and it leads to a significant attrition from the criminal justice system as a whole. So our entire notion of kind of you know doing justice most certainly does lead to further victimization, not even recognizing, of course, the victimization potentially of the offender as they're put into this incarceral environment, um, the potential severing of these important social relationships such as family, the potential victimization of children of the offender who then might not have their parent there. It's a complex discussion. And unfortunately, no matter what we do, we will generally seem to create some form of victimization. There's no real you know, ideal way of addressing crime, but we are doing the best we can through pushing ideals such as restorative justice, so taking things out of this punitive narrative and trying to make it much more about healing. Um, so do you think there are certain personality types that are attracted to professions such as police, i.e. people who are attracted to the idea of power, the idea of control over others? Do you think there needs to be a better process of filtering other personalities in the recruitment process? Um, this is something that obviously uh, I don't think I can speak to, uh, given that it is much more of kind of, you know, a psychology question when you talk about the nature of personality types. Um, and of course, if I did give you kind of you know, my own view, it would be much more speculative. So possibly this is something that you would want to kind of, you know, think about if you're doing your double degree in criminology and psychological sciences, or potentially emailing one of our lovely team of psychologists and they can give you a bit more of a detailed answer in itself. Um, so, uh, we have what about justice to the domestic violence victim? Is the justice happening? Uh, obviously, it's quite problematic when it comes to the victims of any form of gendered violence. Uh, even though we are trying to do justice for these individuals, we further need to recognize that it's quite a hidden form of victimization in itself. And so, unfortunately, despite creating all the best services that we can, um, we don't always kind of we don't always address that victimization. And there are wider reasons for this. Most certainly a very kind of, you know, patriarchal framing within our society, treating women as, uh, as property, substance abuse issues within Australia and across the globe, all of these correlate towards things such as domestic violence. And so when we want to respond to domestic violence, we do need to take a much more generalist approach. We need to start addressing these problematic beliefs within our society as a whole. So we need to kind of, you know, frame women away from property. We need to address substance abuse issues within our community. And that's really the only way that we'll be able to address domestic violence and prevent that victimization. If we can say that justice is ever done for these victims, obviously that's going to be based upon their unique conceptualization of justice. So some people might say that uh, a DBO, uh, a restraining order is essentially doing justice. Other people might feel that that's not justice being done. Um, it's obviously incredibly complex and really depends upon the individual as a whole. Um, yes, any other questions? No, it looks like we've kind of gone through them all. And it's a good thing that I didn't kind of, you know, plan my um, 
experience session to be too long because we have pretty much run out of time. Uh, so we'll just do one more question. Are there any studies on professional victimization, for example, uh, say a lawyer because they can filing a case against an innocent client? Um, this is something that I'm not entirely familiar with. Uh, so, of course, we do get some rather dodgy lawyers within society. That's something that typically is handled by a non-governmental agency when it comes to the law society. Of course, that is quite problematic when it comes to unethical actions committed by people who are a part of these professional organizations, um, not being kind of brought before the criminal justice system in itself. Instead, these professional organizations are self-regulating and might not have the best transparency. And so potentially we can't see justice being done there, which is obviously quite problematic in itself. So um, on that, I will let you all go. Please go and enjoy the rest of your day. I hope to see you in my classes very soon. Um, and if you have any questions, please just do reach out to our course advisors who can give you a walkthrough of everything that you might need. If you have any questions about the session, again, my email is on the uh, ACAP website, uh, webpage and feel free to just shoot me a quick message. Perfect, well, thank you everyone. And uh, yes, I will see you all hopefully next trimester.